The Whistler. I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadow. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, The Disappearing Woman. Beautiful women were very important to the great Grafton. In fact, he had always admitted that his success as a magician depended on an attractive assistant. But when Grafton arrived in Los Angeles from his South American tour and hurried across town to his agent's office, he was alone. Yes, you've been alone ever since you left South America, haven't you, Jim? It was the only safe way in view of your sideline, a sideline which had been netting you big profits. It's well after office hours when you enter the Carlton building. The elevator is automatic now, and there's no one around. But you know that your agent, Earl Crawford, is expecting you. That he'll be waiting in his office on the fourth floor. Oh, so you're back, Grafton. I came here straight from the boat, Crawford. What happened in South America? Why, uh, I did my act. Played the spots you booked for me. I'm not talking about that. I know you're not. What about the money? Uh, it's a long story, Crawford. What do you mean it's a long story? You were able to get rid of the stuff down there, weren't you? I was able to dispose of most of the money, but not all of it. Oh, I see. Well, we'll uh, settle up now. I can't settle up, Crawford. What do you mean? I haven't got it. You haven't got it? What are you talking about? I was robbed on the boat coming back. Somebody broke into my cabin. The secret compartment in my trunk. Well, how did it happen? I don't know. I did exactly as you told me. Stayed by myself, only left my cabin to eat, spoke to no one. What about women? I didn't speak to a woman on the entire trip. Oh, what'd you do about the robbery? Nothing. I couldn't do anything. My hands were tied. What do you mean? I hadn't destroyed the rest of the counterfeit. Why, you idiot. It was stolen along with the real money. If the thief was found, the counterfeit would be discovered. And whoever got it knows you're mixed up in the counterfeit racket. That's about it, Crawford. Uh... You're in trouble, Grafton. In plenty of trouble. What do you mean, trouble? I didn't print that phony money myself, you know. I know that. There are but... people higher up. You do your explaining to them, too. I don't want to get involved. You are involved, Grafton. But you said... What's the idea of the gun, Crawford? I haven't taken no chances. Just come along. Tell your robbery story to the big boys. But listen, Crawford, you can cover for me. Book my act, and I'll make it up. Nothing doing. Then I'll get somebody else to book me and turn my entire salary over to you. You can't get a booking without a new girl to help you. Takes time. As a magician working alone when you're Okay, just... Crawford. Let's get going. Right. Just a minute, Crawford. Look out! That was the oldest trick in the world, Crawford. And you fell for it. Put down that gun, Grafton. Let's talk this over. Nobody knows you took the counterfeit to South America. Uh-huh. I'll cover for you. You bet you will, Crawford. You bet you will. It was all unexpected, wasn't it, Jim? But you hope that you may be able to slip out of the building unseen. You wipe your fingerprints from the gun, drop it beside Crawford's body, and then turn out the light. As you steal out into the hall, you snap the lock on the office door. No one is in sight. You're heading for the stairway when a young woman comes around a turn in the corridor and stands squarely in your path. Oh, Mr. Grafton. I beg your pardon? Well, you are the great Grafton, aren't you? What makes you think so? Well, you were pointed out to me on the boat. I tried to talk to I'm you. sorry, I'm in a hurry. But I want you to help me, Mr. Grafton. Yes? Well, what can I do? My name is Anita Ballard. I'm a dancer. I just got back here from Central America. I just have to have a job right away, and I don't know anybody in town. I see. There's a booking agent on this floor. His name is Earl Crawford. You know most of the agents. Perhaps you could introduce me to him. Uh, it's not likely that he would be in his office at this hour. Huh? No. Well, I suppose not. I just came here out of desperation. 
I heard that Crawford always has an opening of some sort. Well, if you're looking for a job, maybe you won't need to see Crawford after all. Well, what do you mean, Mr. Grafton? I might have something for you. I need a girl for my act. Oh, that would be wonderful. I've had experience as a magician's assistant. I was a box jumper with Barton one season. Well, that sounds fine. We'll talk about it. Over a steak. A perfect idea. Over a steak. By the time you reach a nearby restaurant, you've a plan of action in mind, haven't you, Jim? Anita Ballard must disappear before Crawford's body is discovered. She must not be around to testify that she met you on the fourth floor of the Carlson building. As you look at her across the restaurant table, you wish there were some other way, don't you, Jim? She's strikingly beautiful, with classic features and long black hair. She would make the perfect assistant for a magician. But you know that your one chance is to get her in a car on some pretext and drive her out of town. And as soon as possible, before anyone you know sees you together. You're not enjoying your steak, Mr. Grafton. Something bothering you? Oh, uh, no, Anita. Nothing. I'm just thinking. About what? About you. About what to do with you. I suppose you're prepared to travel. Oh, how soon? Well, I have some extra equipment stored in San Diego. I think I'll drive down there tonight. You haven't anything to keep you here, have you? No, not a thing. Mm -hmm. All right, then, Princess. Princess? Uh, my assistant is always called Princess Naya. <laughs> That's a pretty name. And you're a pretty girl. I'm sure we'll get along well together. I'm sure we will. <laughs> well, let's go. Okay. Well, well, if it isn't the great Grafton. Oh. Oh, uh, hello, Fillmore. <laughs> Thought you were in South America, Grafton. I just got back. Hey, if you'll excuse us. Now, please. wait a minute, Grafton. I ought to meet the princess. I suppose this is the present princess, Naya. Well, yes, I am, Mr. Fillmore. Mm. Well, there have been a lot of princess Nayas, each one more beautiful than the last. But I must say, Grafton, you've outdone yourself this time. You know, with such a lovely partner, I might be able to find you a bookie. Well, you're very flattering, Mr. Fillmore. Uh, I take it that you're an agent? That's right. Oh, uh, mind if I sit down a minute, Grafton? Oh, no. Uh, no, of course not. Uh, you know, I, I'm not kidding about the booking, Grafton. I need a magic act for the Garden Club in New York. What does it pay? 500 a week, three-week guarantee. Oh, that sounds interesting. But no buts about it, Grafton. <laughs> You'll take it and you know it. But we're going to have to hurry. You and the princess have got to leave for New York on the midnight plane. Fillmore upset your plans, didn't it? And you're forced to take Anita to New York as the Princess Naya, the assistant in your magic act. Her presence near Crawford's office at the time of his murder makes her dangerous to you, doesn't it? And you can't see a way out of the situation. But when you read an item about the shooting in the New York papers, you receive a surprise. Crawford's counterfeit dealings were suspected by the police, and underworld characters are being sought in connection with his death. Yes, it's a big load off your mind, isn't it? And especially when Anita makes no reference to the affair and turns out to be very good in your act. Then at the end of your first week at the club, you knock at her dressing room door. Come in. Good news, Anita. I've been talking to the manager. He's crazy about the act. Mm, we're getting over well, aren't we? Yeah. You're doing a swell job. Ah, that's nice to hear. Oh, by the way, I got paid. Here's your salary. I want to talk about that. What's the matter? Isn't it enough? No, it isn't. Well, what do you want? I want half, Jim. Half? Mm-hmm. $250, half the act. But in Los Angeles, we agree. The circumstances were different then. At that time, I didn't know that your agent Crawford had been murdered. Well, well what's that got to do with it? Everything. You did it, and I know it. Well, that's ridiculous. Everything fits together. Crawford was probably mixed up in counterfeiting. Same as you. Counterfeiting? 
I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. Our meeting outside his office wasn't accidental. I'd followed you there from the boat. But, but why? Because I found out you were mixed up in the counterfeit racket. How? That's my business. And from now on, I intend to cash in on my discovery. What do you mean by that? I stole your money on the boat, Jim. There's nothing you can do about it. But I'm going to use it for your own best interest. My best interest? Mm-hmm. The act needs dressing up. New wardrobe, new scenery, some startling new illusions. Big time stuff. Big money. What I've always wanted. I see. You're a good magician, Jim. You've got everything. Appearance, poise. With me and a girl to double for me in the big six, we can be a big success. And half goes to you? Half goes to me. And you propose to use my own money to build the act? Exactly. What about the counterfeit money you took? <laughs> that I'll keep for my own protection. To see that I'm not double-crossed. Well, your frankness is alarming, Anita. Does it annoy you, Jim, to realize you're dealing with someone as uh, ruthless as yourself? Hmm. Uh, hmm? Not at all. And to prove it, I say we'll go right ahead. I mean, with your plans for the new act. The big illusion. Good. You'll start interviewing girls for my double right away. I will. I'll be on the lookout myself. Don't want to put all the burden on my dear partner. Thank you, Anita. Very thoughtful. Let me know if you find anyone. Oh, Jim. Uh, yes, Anita. Look who I found. Connie Nelson, my new double. This is Mr. Grafton, Connie. The great Grafton. Hello. How do you do? What do you think of her, Jim? Oh, not bad. Not bad at all. She's the same height as I am, same weight. Even her features are much the same. She looks amazingly like you, Anita. Except for her blonde hair. Well, that's all the better. She can wear a black wig and a show, and off stage, nobody will know she's with the act. Any objections to traveling, Connie? Oh, no, Mr. Grafton. I'd love it. You may find it a bit lonely. You won't be able to stay at the same hotel as the Princess Naya and I, or even be seen with us in public. No one, not even my agent, is going to know that there's more than one girl with the act. Well, I see, but is that perfectly honest? How do you mean? Well, pretending I'm not with the act when I am. <laughs> well, uh, the world of magic is based on deception. But the people love it. You'll really be contributing to the amusement of the public. Oh, in that case, I, I'd like to do it. Very well. I'll come back in the morning at ten. Thank you, I will. Goodbye, Mr. Bastion. Goodbye, Connie. Well, what do you think? Interesting. Very Interesting. You mean her looks or her scruples? They're both rather unusual. Well, just so you don't become too interested, Jim. What do you mean? We don't need any complications. Such as? Either one of you forgetting there's only one Princess Naya. Mm. I'm sure I won't forget that, Anita. I'll see that she doesn't. Yes, Anita. I'm quite sure that you will. <laughs> Anita has just given you an idea, hasn't she, Jim? And perhaps it could work if you're careful. You avoid speaking to Connie except on business until the act gets started and you're booked out of town. And then one day, you manage to run into her in a park. Well, hello, Connie. Oh. You're watching the swan? Mr. Grafton. Yes, I've been here for hours. You know, I, I get awfully lonesome. Oh, you poor kid. I suppose you do. If only I had someone to talk to. A pretty girl like you shouldn't have much trouble about that. Oh, but don't you see, I, I can't talk to anyone. If I did, I, I'd have to tell them who I am, that I'm with the act. You're awfully honest, aren't you, Connie? Well, of course. You keep a secret very well. You know, I've been thinking, how would you like me to teach you something about magic? It would help pass the time for you. Oh, I'd love it. Would you do that? I'd have to arrange so that no one knew about it, not even Anita. <laughs> I could teach you her part in the act. And then if she ever got sick and was unable to work, you could replace her. That would be a nice surprise for her, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? And then, of course, someday, she might decide to leave the act. That's the beginning, isn't it, Jim? You start working with Connie in secret, grooming her to take Anita's place. For Anita is going to leave the act, isn't she? Yes, she's going to disappear. 
One of these days when Connie is ready, Anita will arrive in town as the Princess Naya. But when the act leaves town, the Princess Naya will be Connie, wearing her black wig. But there are details to work out, and they're difficult. It's not until you reach the West Coast that a solution appears. And then one night, a Mr. Norman pays you a visit. He wants you to appear at a benefit to raise funds for a local charity. It's going to be a big thing, Mr. Grafton. Every performer in town is taking part. Well, I'd be glad to help out, but we're closing here Friday night. We, we leave for Los Angeles Saturday morning. You uh, couldn't stay over for Saturday night? Why, I, I don't know. We don't open in Los Angeles till the first of the week. Well, did you ever think about making the trip down the coast by boat? By boat? Mm -hmm. Why, no, I hadn't. My wife and I made the trip a few weeks ago. It'd give you a very good rest. Yes, I can imagine. I'll tell you. There's a boat leaving Saturday night about midnight. Now, uh, why don't you stay over and work the benefit? We'll put you on stage about 10 o'clock, so you'll have plenty of time to get to the boat. Well, now you mention it, that's not a bad idea. I was sure you'd see it. <laughs> but I'll tell you, Mr. Norman, I wouldn't be able to do my big illusion of the benefit. It requires too much work to set up. Oh, that's all right. Just uh, do some of your other stuff, just so you make an appearance. Well, in that case, it's all set. I don't see why not. I'm always glad to help a good cause. The setup couldn't be better, could it, Jim? As you talked to Norman, the whole thing took shape in your mind. A big benefit performance. Hundreds of people around. The perfect time for Anita's disappearance. If you don't use the big illusion, you will need only one girl. Both Anita and Connie will arrive to assist you. But Connie will do the act and go to the boat as the Princess Naya. And Anita's body will be in the secret panel of your large... Have the trunk put in your cabin. And once you're at sea, it will be very easy to dispose of Anita, won't it? But the next day, when you talk to Connie... I can't understand it, Connie. You, you say you want to leave the act? Yes, Jim, right away. I want to go when we close here Friday night. Oh, but you can't do that. You can find another girl to double for Anita. But why, Connie? Why? Please, don't ask me. But you can't leave now, Connie. Please wait a few weeks. No, I've made up my mind. It's the only way out. Way out? Out of what? All this secrecy. This meeting you privately. What it does to me. Can't you understand, Jim? What it does to you? Can't you see, Jim? I'm in love with you. It's, it, it's not your fault. It just happened. It's been so good to me, so kind. But there's no future for us. Oh, Connie, darling. Of course there's a future for us, a wonderful future. Why do you suppose I've been working so hard with you, teaching you everything I know? It's because I want you as my partner. But Anita's a Princess Naya. Anita and I are going to split up. But I couldn't take another woman's job. It wouldn't be fair. There's nothing unfair about falling in love. Mary? Yes. I love you, Connie. I've loved you for a long time. Have you, dear? Of course. But now, about Anita. I'm going to talk to her. When, Jim? Right away, this week. I'll make arrangements to buy her half of the act. Oh, can you do that? I think so, but we mustn't let her suspect that we're in love. Why not? Well, it's not wise. Uh, for business reasons. She might take advantage of the fact to drive a hard bargain. So we probably shouldn't see much of one another for the rest of the week. But you meet me Saturday morning in Abby's Jewelry Store. Oh, Abby's jewelry store, but why? You'll see, Connie. You'll see. Hello, dear. Oh. You've been waiting long? Oh, no, just a few minutes. I've been looking at these cigarette cases. Aren't they beautiful? Oh, yes. yes. Especially that gold one. It's very nice. I'd like to buy it for you. Oh, we aren't here to buy anything for me. We're going to buy something for you. A diamond engagement ring. And it's all settled? Yes. Anita is leaving the act. You're going to open in Los Angeles. In fact, you may have a chance to break in at the benefit tonight. Tonight? Uh-huh. Now, to tell you the truth, Anita and I had a little disagreement about our financial settlement. Oh. She's in a very bad humor. I don't know whether she's going to play the benefit or not. Oh, I'll come to the theater. No, 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 no. You, you stay at your hotel. But be made up and ready at about... 9.30. Then if Anita doesn't want to go on, I'll call you. Of course. I'll be waiting. And now we'd better see about a ring. Things are working out very well, aren't they, Jim? 
You're buying an engagement ring for Connie. Another step in setting the stage for Anita's disappearance. You've told Anita to be at the benefit at 9.30. And when she comes to your dressing room, you're ready for her. A few minutes later, Anita Ballard's body is in the secret panel of your trunk. Then you go to a phone and call Connie. And she hurries over and the act goes on at about 10 o'clock. Connie is nervous and excited, but she does the act perfectly. How did I do, Jim? Was I all right? You were good, Connie. Very good. Oh, I'm glad. Well, I'd better change. We haven't much time, have we? No, no. Uh, we'll take a taxi straight to the boat. By the way, keep on your black wig. Oh. You're the Princess Naya now, you know. Well, that's right, I am. Oh, are these you possible? <laughs> you can dye your hair black on the boat. Oh, here are the men for the baggage. Excuse me, dear. I'll be ready in a minute, dear. Mm -hmm. uh, right in here, fellows. I'm all packed. Ah. Well, let's go. Yes, and I want it all put in my cabin. Right, Mr. Grafton. Now, be careful with that big trunk. Okay. Take that in, Joe. Hey, this is a heavy one. Yes, it is rather heavy. I'll bet one of your best tricks is in here. Yes, as a matter of fact, my very best trick. The disappearing woman. Well, Jim, when you board the boat, go to your cabin and find your luggage all in place. You finally feel very safe, don't you? There's only the matter of getting rid of Anita's body, now hidden in your property trunk. When the boat reaches the open sea, she will have disappeared forever. Yes, it won't be long. You're glancing at your watch when there's a knock on the door. Oh, Connie, come in. Soon do we sail? In about 15 minutes. Good. And there's still time. Hmm? Time for what, darling? For the cigarette case to arrive. Cigarette case? Mm hmm? That gold cigarette case you admired this morning. I bought it for you. I had your initials put on it, so I couldn't take it with me. But they promised to deliver it to the boat. You bought me such an expensive gift? But how could you afford it? Well, the money was a present from Anita. I told her about our engagement. You told her? When? This afternoon, I had to. I felt it was dishonest to keep it from her. He seemed very happy about it. He gave me the money and insisted that I use it to buy your present. Oh, that must be the cigarette case now. How do you do? I'm Rice from the Treasury Department. I'd like to see Mr. Grafton. Well, he's right here. Won't you come in? What do you want? Some counterfeit money was used to buy a cigarette case to be delivered to you here on the boat, Mr. Grafton. Well, I don't know anything about it. Counterfeit money? Yes, the passer is described as a blonde girl about 20 years old. She entered old dark man. They bought a diamond ring using good currency. Then later, she came in alone with the counterfeit. Now, just what's your connection to Miss Grafton? Well, it's all very simple. Keep out of this, Connie. Mr. Grafton is the dark man, and I'm the blonde girl. You are? Oh, yes, I, I, I'm wearing a black wig. What is this, Grafton? What are you trying to pull? Please, this is a mistake. We're honest people. I believe you where you got the money you spent for the cigarette case. That money was given to me by a girl named Anita Ballard. Mm-hmm. Where is she now? But I don't know. She's gone. Well, we'll pick her up. All right, come on. You both have to get off the boat. Oh, now, wait a minute. It's time to sail. I'll have the boat held until your luggage is taken off. But my luggage? Well, yes, Mr. Grafton. We'll have to make a thorough search of your luggage. You know, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we found the plates in the printing press for the counterfeit money right over there in that big property trunk. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Betty Lou Gerson, Les Trinane, Jean Bates, Bill Boucher, and Jess Kirkpatrick. The Whistler was directed by George W. Allen, with story by George Adrian and Carol Nick, music by Wilbur Hatch.